Could you explain to a regular person what is technical art history? How does it differ, differ from the, old, so to speak, old school art history? Well, uh, technical art history is combining different ways of uh, studying artworks and it's very much uh, focusing on, uh, let's say, art in the making. So the process from idea to final result. Um, the materials that are being used, the techniques, the studio practice, artists working together, all these things are part of that. Um, and to study this properly, uh, it's often an interdisciplinary collaboration between art historians, curators, um, conservators and conservation scientists. And uh, they all do their own part of the research, but combining their expertise and the results gives a very good interpretation of questions about the making. Um, and so that, that makes it different from a more theoretical disciplinary approach where you only use uh, art historical methodology and, and the history of things and uh, the iconography uh, that's very different although ideally you combine that with the technical research could you give us an, an example of uh, you know of a detail or an aspect that a, a connoisseur a great expert of art history would not be able to say or tell compared to a technical art historian um, well, you can, you can, if you look at the, the paintings in this exhibition, uh, first of all, uh, we would really look at the way they are painted and we use uh, all kinds of technical means to do that. And in some cases, uh, you can look, for example, through the paint layer with the infrared and see the underdrawing. That underdrawing tells you a lot about um, uh, the way the composition was um, thought through, was it uh, very much a copy after a model that they already had. You can see that in the style of the underdrawing. If it's very sketchy and sort of searching, then you have the feeling this is maybe an original uh, idea being worked out. Um, that is something you, as a connoisseur, if you only look at the surface of the painting, you can't see for example. So it does give the connoisseur as well a lot of extra tools if there is this interdisciplinary collaboration. And um, uh, the, the a very well-known um, curator in New York, Marion Ainsworth, said that technical art history is the new connoisseurship. Um, well, not everybody might agree with that, but it, in a way it, it adds a lot of tools to connoisseurship to help uh, get the right answers. When you first heard about this particular project that is on display today here, what were your first reactions? Um, well, what I really like about this project is that um, in many cases we focus on the big masters uh, and uh, the original hand and uh, a lot of projects actually focus on getting that, you know, identification, attribution. But in this case, we know that uh, we don't know who painted the paintings. Um, we know that they were made probably to answer to a very big demand in the art market in Antwerp in the 16th century. They're not the top kind of, there's not a Rubens or, you know, that kind of studio, but there must have been a huge production of this kind of works, good quality, uh, good quality painters working on them, um, and, but why did they do that? Why did they copy or make more than one version? Uh, so that it, it evokes all kinds of really interesting questions. So that, that for me is, is very exciting. That, that, that layer underneath the big masters, which must have served a really big sort of market, and uh, the, the bourgeoisie of course was the big market at that time, uh, but we don't know so much about this kind of production. And so this is a start, I would say, of hopefully finding more of similar cases and, and studying them in the same way. Well, the obvious main question is, of course, we see here four uh, pictures that come from different countries, but are very, very similar down to the smallest detail. Um, what was originally known about how or why these pictures were so, were so, um, so similar? Um, well, you, you need to go back to the place where they were produced, and which is very, very likely Antwerp in the 16th century, and then look at the art market there at that time. Um, it was uh, a really 
demanding art market. There was a lot of uh, exports, for example, to Spain. Um, there were uh, there was a, a big sort of middle class uh, getting more and more wealthy with money to spend, and the studios would produce paintings that were very popular in th uh, as a theme. Uh, but also um, the val value of a copy, as we now we, we now see that in a slightly negative or a very negative way, really. But at that time, uh, it wasn't seen so much like that. And um, that's also uh, the, the quality of these copies is very high. So they were made by respectable artists, which means that there must have been a sort of a general uh, agreement, if you like, amongst the clientele that it would be valuable to have a copy after Bosch, in this case maybe, or a copy after another big master. And you find in inventories quite often that it is said, a, a version of a copy after. Uh, and these are inventories from respectable collectors. So it, it's very connected to the, the demand of the art market. And, um, and there were, of course, dynasties of families like the Breugel family, where everybody was a painter and they all copied uh, popular compositions and if you look in the the archive material you can see that a lot of that was exported and so on so it was a, f a free market system and that's i think how they fit in what were the what were the uh, most important questions that you had starting this project what was most in interesting for you um well, the most important question actually would be, um, can we find the model for these paintings? Um, the, you know, is there a print or is there another lost composition? Or is it a, a combination of um, uh, elements from different sources, a pastiche into a new composition that then was leading its own life and co being copied? And that's we haven't, uh, un unfortunately, we haven't yet answered. Um, but um, so the next question was yes, indeed, why do these paintings, four paintings in different styles, and as we now have seen through the dendrochronology from different periods as well, so why do they exist? Why do they exist with so much time in between them? And what was their function? So, what's the function of this kind of painting? So, that was actually the main question, trying to understand that. Okay, when you started this project, how would you go about, you know, researching or, you know, investigating this, these particular paintings using uh, methods of uh, technical art history? Yes, well, um, we've, we've created a sort of a protocol trying to uh, uh, do the same thing with each painting. And uh, so the, the, the protocol consisted of getting x-rays from each painting, infrared, reflectograms from each painting, uh, UV, images um, and also cross-sections um, uh, from each painting to be able to compare the materials and the techniques, plus the dendrochronology, uh, which uh, um, now three paintings, we, of three paintings we know the dates and hopefully soon also from the fourth. And that, um, that gives you all the technical information and with uh, the cross sections you do uh, polarized light microscopy and understand this, the build up of the layers because that tells you a lot about the technique and the studio practice and you can compare that you know how did they build up the, the red in in the paintings and you can compare that with in each painting for example um, and um, also we did scanning electron microscopy which looks at the elements present and you can analyze a particle or you can analyze an area um, and it gives you the elements so that identifies the pigments, especially if, you, if you're not quite sure with just the microscopy. It also tells you something about the structure of the sample. Well, what's the useful information in you know, getting to know what's the chemical composition of a, of a paint used? Well, you can, you can um, first of all, you can compare the pictures better and the materials because it can sometimes tell you, well, this is exactly the same way the built up and maybe it comes from the same workshop, but then done by two people working in that workshop, hence the differences between them. You, know, um, you can also see how, how, what kind of materials they use. For example, the ground layer on all these paintings is chalk. 
and in the Tallinn painting we found in the scanning electron microscope that there are little coccoliths, little shells still visible in that chalk layer while in the other paintings you don't see them anymore because the chalk is ground much finer. So uh, that is really interesting and, and you see uh, also that in the Tallinn painting it seems that that ground layer has two applications. So the coarse one with the little shells in it and then a finer one. Uh, so all that kind of information is really interesting for comparison and for understanding the, the practice. In, uh, in movies or TV series you always see these detectives using a UV light and then yeah. there's an, a, a completely different picture uh, that becomes apparent. Um, how different was the picture, um, picture regarding these paintings when you used the UV or, or X-ray? Um, well, with the UV you see mainly, the, in this case, uh, the, the retouchings and overpaintings because the fluorescence of the varnish in those areas is less because there's slightly less varnish on it because there's this, this extra little layer in between. Um, so that's, that's very much what you see in the UV. If there's, uh, if there's no varnish on it, then some of the pigments have a different fluorescence, so that can be helpful. Um, but it, it, it doesn't really tell you that much about the techniques, for example, uh, only maybe some of the materials used. Um, but X-ray can be very interesting. It can explain changes because uh, often you would find that in, in, in that some lead white in the paint and you know you can see uh, first of all he did this and then he changed it and then color comes on top so you don't really see it anymore in the, norm, in the final result. Uh, we didn't see big changes in these paintings, so they were quite close following the composition that was in the underdrawing. But in other cases uh, it can be extremely revealing, yes, yes. It can also tell you something about the, the structure of the panel, for example. You can see the joints and you can see sometimes that there are dowels in, in, you know, to connect the joints, things like that, uh, also become visible in X-ray. So, uh, it's a structural tool as well, so that uh, no, no, to understand the structure. So that that uh, can all be very useful, and th we documented all the four paintings that way. Well, one of the aspects that I would assume is most interesting or surprising for a regular person is the dendrochronology. Yes. Uh, how does that work? Um, well, basically, you measure uh, uh, the distances between the year rings. And um, then you have, of course, the sapwood area, which is the youngest, uh, which, uh, which looks quite different. Um, by measuring all these distances, which correspond with, uh, for example, it was a very uh, cold winter or some clima climate uh, influence, um, and comparing it to known databases of, in this case, Baltic oak, because all the panels are made of Baltic oak, then you can approximately see when the tree was felled with I think five years plus or minus sort of error margin. Then of course you need to take into account how long a drying, you know, how long the wood needs to season before you can actually use it. Uh, so that adds a little bit of time, but it gives you a, a good time slot of when the panel was ready for use or when the panel could have been made. Um, and that helps uh, dating the paintings. Of course, we have to take into account that they might have had it in the studio for 10 years without painting on it. So you always have to realize that it, there, you know, there is a margin also there, which we don't know about, of course. Uh, but it is a very good tool to, to get a date, on uh, approximate date, on, uh, on a painting like this, like the ones here in the exhibition. Well, this is like uh, detective work uh, that you yes. see on these uh, crime uh, series. Why is this so uh, fascinating for you personally? Why do you love this job? Ah, um, well, I, I've, I've always, I've trained as a conservator as well as, a, as, a, as being an art historian. And uh, I've always been fascinated by um, the actual making of, pay, of, of artwork, so the processes and choices artists make and why did he use that and not that and all these kinds of things. Why does the painting or any artwork look like it does now? Was that the original intent or was that, you know, have, have many changes uh, taken place through aging or other 
influences. Um, and I'm always fascinated uh, also by, um, uh, especially uh, the 16th, 17th century Netherlandish painting, by the incredible skills of these artists. So that's where it sort of started for me, this fascination of how did they do it, to say it very simply. A uh, fascination that, that probably goes back, you, know, you, you all already have explorations of these techniques in the 18th century, but, but the technical art history is a relatively young approach within uh, art history. And uh, so that for me was always uh, the fascination and uh, knowing uh, more about it, understanding it, how did they do it, the tricks of the trade and so on and so on. But once you go into this world, um, uh, it's a very uh, interesting, very fascinating, huge area of, of material because there is not just the works of art, but there's also, for example, a huge body of treatises and manuals where artists wrote down their recipes and their secrets and how did they do it, um, which is fascinating. They're everywhere in archives and so on. So that's another area of technical art history that comes into this. and. Uh, so it's, it's a wide-ranging area, not just the, the actual techniques, but also where did these materials come from, which also in this exhibition sort of discussed the journeys of all these materials and pigments, and um, also crossover between disciplines, you know, yellow pigments used in potter's uh, glazes, uh, being used in painting, and so more and more we get to know about it, the more and more we see all these links and connections and workshop practices there, where they, they exchanged information. Uh, so it's a fascinating world. And I think it's a very important world to understand if you study the paintings. Uh, even if you're, uh, as you said, a traditional art historian, um, knowing a little bit more about this uh, helps to understand the production and the, the, you know, why these paintings are there, really. And so I think uh, the combination of all these things is what makes it fascinating. One would assume that you would be disappointed when you discovered, without a doubt, that none of these painting, paintings are actually made by Bosch or Bruegel. Yeah. Um, but you're not dis uh, disappointed, I understand. No, I'm not. Well, in, in, in first instance, we sort of knew that they were not made by Bosch and Bruegel, but um, uh, I think that this, this search for the hand of the master, this sort of authenticity attribution search is um, uh, very much connected, of course, with connoisseurship. It is a very important part of history of art. And it's, it's also part of what we do. But on the other hand, uh, what we also want to know is uh, very much insights into the practice at the time. So then it's not that relevant. Uh, if it is by Bosch or Bruegel, or if it is a, a painting that tells us a lot about that practice at the time. So uh, I'm, I'm never really disappointed if it's not by the master. If it is, then if you can prove that, because that's very difficult, then of course that's very exciting. But that's not the first uh, objective, that's not the first aim we are after. So to uh, re-summarize, what are the main discoveries of, of this particular project? For you? For me, um, um, I think what for me was really interesting is to get uh, insight into uh, this uh, sort of revival of Boschian, Bruegel kind of imagery and how then in practice that is translated into other versions and copies and whatever you want to call them. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a, uh, replicas, that's a, a different story because we don't, still don't have the model, so we don't quite know how much was changed and what was used. But I think that was, the, 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 for me, the insights in these processes and the, how they did it and trying to figure out how that works and how the four paintings are connected through that same scene, but still they're so different. So why? And all that kind of background context is what, for me, is, is the most interesting question. I think by combining the iconography research, uh, looking into the connections with Bosch and Bruegel, looking into the techniques and using all these different methods, we have come much closer to understanding when they were made, why? Because they fit in in, in this first revival of Bosch um, 
culture, culture, if you like, in the first uh, half of the 15th, 16th century, and the, that's the, the private painting. And then the other two paintings, Stalin Copenhagen, fit in very nicely with that second revival, where then also Bruegel comes in as an influence on the style, and you can see the differences in the style quite, quite clearly. And then the Glasgow painting uh, is also a part of that, probably part of that second revival, but there it's more like a combination of Boschian elements, making sure it looks very much like a Bosch, recognizable for the public. So it's a, yet another kind of um, a revival, if you like. And uh, uh, so that, that, that for me is, is what came out of this, yes. And, and it is also enticing to do more, to look into more of these kind of things.